talk about uh, technology and transition and uh, kind of the way things work as far as technology is concerned. Um, first thing I wanted to do though is, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, speaking of technology, I don't get to make presentations very often, but this is cool. <laughs> I can get on Keynote on my phone and work my laptop over there. Anyway, it's, I like, it's the little things in life that help. Uh, First of all, definition of technology, so we kind of know what we're talking about. The application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. Most of us, when we think technology, we're thinking audio boards, we're thinking lighting, we're thinking all those kind of things. But if we take a broader, bigger picture, technology is anything that, any practical use that we come up with for what science has discovered, okay? So, um, if we try to expand maybe a little bit of our understanding of technology, it, it might help us sometimes in how we want to try to use it. Uh, it's more than just the things that have, we've come up with in the last 15, 20 years. You know, there was technology around before there was uh, the 21st century. Um, there's always been skepticism about using technology. Uh, every time some new technology comes along, there's always problems. Uh, like this guy with the printing press. You can't read it. He says, nice, but as long as there are readers, there will be scrolls. Okay. <laughs> so there's, there's always that skepticism about new technology and how it's going to work and where it's going to fit in. Uh, like this one, protesting against new technology. No wheels here, no new technology. Okay. So, and I'm sure if you've tried to do anything new and upgrade or whatever in your uh, places of service, you know you're dealing with sometimes there's a little skepticism about technology. And that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes we can get caught up in the technology and, and just have technology for technology's sake. Uh, but uh, anyway, sometimes it, it's a skepticism. I wanna, I'm going to do a, a sort of a, a memory lane kind of walk uh, when, here for a minute. When we're talking about writing, this was technology. At one point in time, they moved from oral tradition to writing things down on scrolls and keeping them. The Old Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the libraries at Alexandria, all those kind of things. So this was a technology. They took the ability to be able to write. And then they moved from there to the printing press. And uh, remember that the printing press did more for religious uh, aspects of communication than anything else. Really, I mean, the Gutenberg Bible uh, and, and print, printing things in English in England for, you know, for the people that didn't have that. So this was a huge technology which actually wound up being, at least in the beginning, primarily for, uh, uh, for religious purposes. And then come down a few years later and we start having computers, okay? Um, we get into the digital writing, if you want to put it that way. Uh, the, the ability to take all of those things that they had in the printing press and put them in ones and zeros and, and spread them around. So uh, in the writing area, we see and those, those three are probably pretty predominant, but uh, not a lot of sudden progression. Um, the next thing is if we look at uh, audio, what we hear, how that technology has affected what we hear. You can go all the way back to the amphitheaters, um, they discovered, hey, if we put everybody up on the hill and do it in sort of a circle, the physics, everything bounces off that and people can hear and you would have these huge <laughs> amphitheaters and even then, then developing coliseums where large numbers of people could hear what was happening, uh, what they were trying to communicate. Uh, then we go from that to cathedrals. Uh, we sort of finish the, the theater aspect and we have audio that just sort of bounces around so you can hear it everywhere. 
I don't know if you've ever done a concert or anything in, in one of these cathedrals, but it's, it's unbelievable. I went with a group uh, to uh, Europe uh, one year. I videotaped their choir as they were going through doing concerts, and I literally timed it. We they did, were doing a song up front, and they cut off. You could hear it for 12 seconds. I mean, it was just rattling around that room for about 12 seconds. It was really awesome. But the ability, and, and you can stand in certain cathedrals in certain places, usually around where the, the nave is, and, and talk like this and be heard all over the whole entire area. So uh, the ability to, to take what we hear and amplify. Then we get into uh, electric. We, we started amplifying those sounds, okay? Um, some good old Alltech equipment. There's uh, is the standard of the 50s, <laughs> but um, we were able to amplify that so that we could get it to larger groups of people. We could get it over noise uh, that might be uh, developing in our thing. Electric instruments. Uh, I mean, this this development here allowed a lot of churches to have something that sounded like a pipe organ, but wasn't really a pipe organ. Uh, there's no way they could afford a large pipe organ. But also, uh, other instruments, I mean, you get into electric guitars and book synthesizers as we got into all of that electronic kind of stuff. Um, radio was a big part of this uh, development. I don't know if any of you know this, this guy's named Father Coughlin. He was big in the, in the 30s. He's a Catholic minister. The first, what I would call a lapel mic, I don't know if you can see that or tell, but he's got that strapped around. There's a plate right here that's strapped around his neck, and the microphone is sitting right here. Uh, so he can move around. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, his uh, radio broadcasts were, were very big uh, in the 30s. Um, then we moved from there to record players. We were able to take that sound and put it somewhere where we could make it available to the public for them to have on their, on their own. That was really the first way that that would, that would happen. Uh, Waco was a big benefit of this because word records, you know, start here. And if, if you know anybody that was around and was involved in music in the 50s and 60s, everybody knew, knew word records. In fact, there were a lot of guys, Baylor guys that came through here that sold for word records. That's the way they worked their way through college. Um, but that's, um, then we moved on to the wonderful A-Tracks, okay, and uh, cassettes. The portability of being able to do that uh, was part of that progression. Then to CDs, once we hit the digital world, then we could take that, digitize it, and then MP3s, all of those. Um, so you see sort of the progression of, of our audio world. Um, now let's look at the progression of our, uh, what we see, our sight. Uh, cathedrals started uh, painting. This is the Sistine Chapel. This would not be one of the older ones, but it's the same concept. People didn't have Bibles to read. They didn't have uh, ways to take stuff with them. So when they would come into the worship lot, they would have these gorgeous murals and pictures that would tell the stories that, that about the Bible and about God. And you can see this in a lot of those older cathedrals. They would have all over the place. Just There's probably, um, I think there's something like 36, if I remember correctly, 36 different murals on the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. Each one depicting some aspect of, of, the, of the Bible. Then we moved to stained glass. Uh, the technology that was developed to be able to do this. This is the one in, in Notre Dame in uh, Paris. Uh, probably one of the more recognizable ones. Uh, but they, the pictures, again, telling the story. People could, as they came in, they could see these stories and be reminded of them. Um, if any of you have ever been in the chapel at the Naval Academy, um, it is... Uh, gorgeous place, but all the, the stained glass windows have pictures of stories out of scripture that have to do with the wa with water, and with the ocean, and with the seas, and uh, so it's really, it's really pretty awesome. Uh, then we moved from there to, we started seeing steeples and spires, so as people looked, they would see not only where the church was, but something that was pointed toward God and pointed toward heaven and directed them that way. Uh, then the next thing, uh, electric lights. Electric lights, it's a technology. We don't think about that much because we're so used to it. But it, it really, in a lot of ways, revolutionized people's ability to worship. They could do it in places where, uh, at nighttime, for example, 
they could uh, didn't have to have as many windows uh, so you could see in and so uh, electric lighting now I don't know if you can't really tell because this is sort of this is the most unusual blue church I have ever seen <laughs> in my life and the blue carpet goes with the blue pews yeah. um, it's, it's straight out of the 60s man I had one I remember going to one that was like this um, but anyway electric lights were part of that then um, television and then this man probably symbolized that, in the, especially in the 50s, more than anybody else. Uh, what he was able to do using television and his crusades to, to get the word out into people's homes uh, was a huge benefit uh, for people being able to see the message. Anybody know what this is? I'm glad I got a young group. Anybody know what this is? This is Jot the Dot. Okay. Um, and, and this, I, I selected this, this sort of represents uh, the satellite technology, okay? Um, when we were able to put satellites and communication satellites in the air. I don't know if any of you all know this, but in the late 60s and early, into the 70s, and really even into the 80s to some degree, uh, the Southern Baptists had a satellite network. It was called ACTS, A-C-T-S. And it was worked out of the Radio and Television Commission uh, in Fort Worth. And um, Jot the Dot was one of the cartoons that was created by the Radio and Television Commission to appear on the Axe Network. Um, it was an interesting way. I really thought it was, a, it was an awesome deal. And, well, history and politics kind of go different ways. But um, it was a satellite network. The Baptist provided all this programming. And a local church could get the satellite receiver have the signal come to them, they feed to the local cable network, have their own cable channel. Uh, they could insert their own programming if they wanted to. It was, a, it was really a pretty awesome deal. Um, and, and pretty, um, the technology was, was there and allowed us to be able to do that and it was thinking, I think, pretty good for that time. Uh, it, it, like uh, some other things, became sort of a, um, I guess you say a casualty of the Southern Baptist Wars, um, and so it kind of died off as we got thinking about other things. So um, then we got into DVD players, and once again we hit the digital world. Uh, DVD players, mobile devices, so we could see things pretty much anywhere we wanted to go. Um, then the next category I sort of eh, touch, feel, uh, what's around us, our, our circumstances. Um, the frontier churches were a huge benefit because people didn't have to meet outside in these places where they were settling new town. They didn't have to meet in the bar. You know, they could have their own place. Um, they could be warm in the winter and, and cool in the summer, as cool as could be at that point in time, but much better than being out. So, uh, and, and they were fairly easy to construct, and so a lot of these churches started popping up. That was a technology. Was in. Then we go to the tents. Man, back in, in the 30s and 40s, tent revivals were huge. And in fact, one of the biggest ones started right here at Baylor. Uh, uh, but this is Oral Roberts, if anybody knows who that might be. And uh, the technology of being able to take these tents and set them up wherever, just anywhere around the country, literally thousands of people could be under one of these tents. Uh, and so the technology to be able to do that. So they weren't meeting out in the, in the outdoors. Air conditioning. Air conditioning was a huge uh, plus for churches. Uh, the ability then to not have windows open when it was in the summertime or to, to, to have some sense of comfort, whether it was winter or summer or whatever. Um, I'm sure uh, this kind of, that was interesting to me that they've got this many different units, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what church that is. It is a church though. Um, the first, I'm sure there was interesting conversations the first few times. All those air ducts were in the ceiling, you know, or those ugly things doing up there. Uh, but people liked because it kept them cool. And probably more churches have split over air conditioning problems than anything else either. Uh, that or maybe the color of the carpet. Then indoor plumbing. Indoor plumbing was another technology that helped. We didn't have to go down to the lake to baptize people. We didn't have to go to the river. Uh, we could. I don't know, have any of y'all ever been, actually been a part of a, a baptismal pool that looked like this? This was new to me. I'd never seen one quite like that, but anyway. Um, but indoor plumbing was a technology 
that we were able to utilize, okay? And, and as you can tell, I really sort of broke this down into how we use technology according to our senses, okay? We've got hearing and sight and touch and taste and smell. These two, we do a pretty good job of working with to try to address, okay? Especially hearing. Uh, touch, to some degree, of uh, our, our surroundings, we, we, you know, we try to make things pleasant for people. Taste, uh, probably communion is about the main time that we really invoke that, that sort of sense. This one we don't do much with. Um, at least as bad as we don't do much with. Um, and, and that's a shame because really smell is probably one of our strongest senses. We stick pretty much to these two over here. We like hearing and, and sight. Um, in fact, it, it really was interesting to me, sort of a revelation one year when my kids were little, I had three kids that were within three years old, so we had like three preschoolers at one time, which was fun. But uh, so when we were having, they all three got old enough that they were sitting in church, we went and sat behind the deaf ministry because I figured they wouldn't bother them because I couldn't hear them cutting up. But then I began to sort of watch our service through the, let's say, through the eyes of the deaf, you could say, okay? And if you couldn't hear anything, what would the service be like? If, you, if the only sense you had was a sense of sight, and what I noticed was, and this is, it's not our, just our church, at, this, at least at this point in time, there was not a lot of visual stimulus. I mean, you watched a choir sing, you watched an orchestra play, you watched a preacher preach, uh, but if you couldn't hear those things, there, there was just not a lot of creativity, a lot of difference, a lot of movement. Uh, and and sometimes you might want to try that with your service. If you just uh, shut the sound off, how interesting would your service be for the next year? Um, and we have technology that allows us, to helps us to do that. Uh, on the flip side of that, close your eyes sometime and, and listen to the service and see what you hear and see if that is something that is pleasing to you, if it communicates what you want it to communicate. Um, the senses are the way we get things from people to people. We speak through our sense, uh, our, our mouths, and they hear through their sense of hearing, or they see, or whatever. So the senses are the way we, are our basic technology, if you want to put it that way, that we use. Um, but I just wanted to sort of lay that for you as a groundwork, that technology has been around a long time. And as it changes now, one of the things that's interesting to me is most of the stuff that I just talked about, especially as we got further on, has really happened in my lifetime, which is amazing. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we need to look at is that the, the technology is changing in shorter and shorter and shorter increments. Uh, what does that mean for you? That means that you have to think about, okay, this new technology that's coming out, is it something I need to jump into wholeheartedly? Is it something I need to wait and see for a little bit? Uh, do I need to plan for the next step? Uh, how do I deal with that in, uh, in working through everything? Um, it's not a, a religious uh, example, but there are third world countries that went straight from no communication to cell phone communication. They never had the infrastructure of land of line telephones because they they couldn't they didn't develop that. And then by the time they got to where they might want to develop it, it was easier just to go straight to cell phones. Um, so they skipped a whole generation of technology that a lot of us went through, uh, and so. That's something to keep in mind. Is this a technology that I need? It, it, do I need to be looking at the next technology down the road? Where, where does all that fit in? Because it's going to change faster and faster and faster. Uh, give you a classic example. I was at the National Association of Broadcasters Convention uh, this last year, which is uh, where they have all the new stuff comes in. You know, Sony, everybody does all their new stuff. And there was a, it was amazing. How, there was even beginning to be 8K uh, Stuff there. I mean, 4K was everywhere there. They just assumed that's what it is. But then you were starting to see 8K projectors and 8K monitors, and it just 
it's amazing where that's going, but that's uh, ahead. No, this is not the camera that we are using. This is a camera that we used in the 60s, and we still have it, by the way. Um, but just this year, our church did an upgrade, uh, a long overdue upgrade. Uh, we broadcast every Sunday morning on television, and uh, we've been doing it since the late 60s. Um, for a large part of the portion, the, the local channel came out with their equipment and did that for us. Uh, and they, it actually started out as a rotation. They would come to us one week, and the Methodists one week, and the Baptists, uh, the Catholics one week, and so they would just kind of do a rotation. Um, then in the early 90s, uh, that changed, and we had to provide our own production. And so we also changed stations, and we went to every Sunday, but we started out with a couple of cameras and a little switcher and a microwave, and that's kind of what we did. Um, and we've grown from there, uh, but we have been long overdue to make the jump to high definition, uh, largely because going from analog to high definition is not something you can really do piecemeal very well. And so we've been trying to work to where we can get it. So we did that just this last year. And so I'm going to uh, show you a little bit about that process. This was, I'll tell you what, I know there's a lot of glare here. Let me see this out. It's the one on the right. There we go. There we go. That's a little better. This was our 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 setup uh, for about the last ten years. Uh, this switcher is a raw switcher from 1986. Okay. Um, all these monitors, haphazard, different kinds, whatever that we grabbed is. Oh, you don't need that monitor anymore. Okay, we'll use it. That that that's the way we sort of acquired things. Um, we had two remote cameras. These were the remote controls. We could either put them here or another place where people could sit and operate them and then one man camera that we use. Um, let me show you a little, a little different shot. This, is, this back here is that area I just showed you, but this is sort of a looking at the room. We had our remote controls. We could set them here and people would operate. Um, our audio board here. Microwave was up on the top. And uh, for a while we were doing live. Then uh, we had a situation where we took our traditional, uh, I'm going to use the right terminology, we, use it. we took our choir-led service, that's what we call it, our choir-led service and moved it to 830 and, and did a, a band-led service at 11. And so we wanted to keep, uh, our audience was really more of the older audience uh, through the years we had developed. So we wanted to keep that. So we recorded the 8.30 service and then played it back at 11. So we were doing that for a while. Our church felt real strong about being having a service on that was the same week and not having the delay. Uh, there's a lot of positives for that. It, it creates a little more work, but you get a Father's Day sermon on Father's Day. And you get you know Memorial Day service on Memorial Day. Anyway, um, so we were doing that. Um, so then what we decided was when we made the, the jump to HD, we had a two-week period. We had one Sunday where we were not broadcasting, so we ended on one Sunday, broadcast, tore everything out, redid it, did it, and two weeks later we were up with HD. So we literally just tore the room out completely um, down to bare wires and stuff, which is funny because a few years when we did that particular setup, I put in all HDSDI cabling because I thought, oh, this will be great. Then when we get ready to make the jump, all we have to do is put in new equipment and we won't have to run all new wiring. Well, mm -hmm. since things had changed, we completely changed the way we did the room. So <laughs> it was pretty much meaningless. But anyway, uh, so in two weeks then we turn in, this is what we have now. Um, we have a graphics station here with an iMac. We, have a, uh, we still have a raw switcher, but it's a new one. Um, mm -hmm producer station and then what we call an engineering station where you can uh, match the cameras and uh, check things. The multi-views, this is an incredible invention. It's just such a wonderful part of everything now uh, to be able to do that. Um, then um, everything basically went into two racks. All the guts and everything were here, just two racks. It was real simple. Um, this is what you would see if you were looking, sort of sitting as the director. Um, then we, we went back to man cameras, traditional studio style man cameras. Um, it just, this is a little plus. Remote cameras cannot be operated as well as man cameras. 
uh, you just get better quality. Number one, the movement is can be a little smoother, especially if you've got a camera guy that knows what he's doing. A cameraman has a much better sense of the presence in the room. You know, when somebody's coming in from over here, they can kind of see it out of their eye, or if something's happening over here, and 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 that can be a big help. Um, so we went back to man cameras. Uh, engineering station here. We have three remote cameras right now. We're going to be adding a uh, not remote camera, three remote uh, controllers here. Uh, we're going to be adding a fourth soon. They they can sit there. One person can control the iris and paint them and make them look the same and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then a router so he can route things wherever we need to. Um, he has his engineering monitor here that has waveform and vector scope and all the tools that he needs to be able to read his signal. And um, make sure that's off. There we go. Um, and then there's another shot of the cameras here. Um, so, some tips, the things that I've learned about this process that, that might be uh, helpful to you. Um, the first thing is, what is your purpose for your change? If you're going to upgrade some equipment, if you're going to uh, change everything around, what is the purpose? Why are you doing this? Um, the church down the road has HD projectors, so we need HD projectors is not the reason for making the change, okay? Um, why are you making this change? We were making this change because we were on television every Sunday. And it, it really required that we become an HD operation. Uh, because what we were putting out on the air was not the quality that everyone, I said that everyone else had around. It just, it wasn't up to the standards of the broadcast. Uh, and so it really needed to be done. Plus, there were some things that we couldn't do graphically that I wanted to do. Um, there were some uh, ways that we were recording and putting things out that just didn't weren't up to the standards that we really thought they needed to be. So that's why that's why we made the change. But something we should have done years ago. But anyway, for whatever reason, we didn't. So what is the purpose for making the change? Um, is there something new that you're wanting to do in your worship? Uh, is the equipment just literally falling apart, uh, not operational in some ways? Are you costing you more to keep maintenance than it is to, to make the change? Are you changing your service style? Or you, you know, what? Have a good, clear idea about why you want to make this change. First of all, it helps keep you focused when you go to start putting all the pieces together. And secondly, it, it gives something very concrete for your church to understand. Um, so they're not thinking, oh, he just wants to do that because he likes all the bells and whistles, you know. Uh, so make sure you have a very clear uh, idea on which, what your purpose is. Where does this fit into your church's mission? You need to know our mission for all these years has been broadcast and provide a service for the public uh, there uh, in, here in the Central Texas area. So that's been part of our mission, and people want that to be part of the mission of Columbus Avenue Baptist Church. So, okay, well, if that's our mission, then we need to do it well, and so here's what we need to do. So how does this fit into your mission? Um, are you, is there a new group of people you're wanting to reach out to? Is there, um, do you feel like there's a, a part of your worship or a part of your Sunday school or a part of your missions work that needs uh a change or uh, a new direction or something like that. Where does all this fit into the mission of what you're trying to do? Find someone you can trust. And by that I mean find someone that is knowledgeable that you can trust. That's probably what I should have typed in there. Um, and this doesn't, doesn't have to necessarily be a person outside your church. Um, I have a guy that, that I've worked with for years and he is on our crew most of the time. But he's somebody I know I can trust. And when we sit down and talk about these things, he'll tell me, Les, that's a dumb idea. Or, Les, that's really smart. Or, why don't you try this? Or, if, if I were you, I'd go this direction. Someone you can trust that's not trying to sell you something. Okay? Now, that's not to say that people that work in the industry and sell things can't be honest and forthright and all those things. But just have somebody you can trust that you can run these things through and talk through 
uh, situations to say, okay, if we're going to do this, we have to do this and this and this and this. Does that make sense? Those kind of things. Have someone you can trust. And then how much will it cost, not how much do I have to spend? Okay. If you go on the basis of uh, how much do I have to spend, you will never be happy with whatever it is you do. Now, that's not to say that everything costs more than we think it does, but if you determine first how much something, how much will it cost, what you've done then is you have developed your plan and you have looked at all the possibilities and all the options. Um, I'll tell you, part of this in a minute, I'll tell you why that became important to us, but uh, also then you could, it's something you can share with your people, okay? Okay, we're going to make this... We're gonna, we need to get these new projectors. You know, these are failing on us. They're not working properly. They're the wrong format. They're the all these kind of things. It's going to cost us to have good, decent projectors. It's going to cost us ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, whatever you figure you come up with. Okay, this is what it's going to cost. So then the people know what they're giving to, what they're supporting, why why all this needs to be done, rather than okay, we have. We're going to do, start a new service in our fellowship hall, and we have $600 in our budget. Go. You know, um, you need to be able to say, okay, we want to start a new service in our fellowship hall, and in order to do that and do that well, here's what it's going to cost. Uh, now, they may come back and say, well, sorry, we don't have that money. You're going to have to do it anyway. But from your perspective, you need to have that. How much will this project cost? Okay? That's not just how much do I have to spend. Uh, what infrastructure will be required? That's usually what trips people up. What infrastructure will be required? Uh, electrical is a huge uh, infrastructure that many times will cause people problems. Uh, for example, in 98, we did a fairly sizable renovation on our sanctuary. And at that point in time, I was able to convince them in the budget of the thing, we went in and all of our plugs, uh, electrical plugs on the stage, in our audio area, and our video area, are all isolated ground. Um, it's a separate ground and they're all separate breakers and it's all done that way. And there's orange, they're orange plugs wherever you see that isolated ground. We did that and we have had no hum problems. We have had no hum bars, lines that go across your, your video, you know, because you've got grounding issues with your electricity. Um, infrastructure is, is very crucial. Um, yeah, I was talking yesterday. We, uh, about three times a year, we bring in a, a truss to set up and do a lot of lighting for a Christmas program or whatever it might be. And through the process of this, we discovered that our building is not three phase, which a lot of the equipment nowadays is designed around three phase. So we had to do some creative wiring even to get to the point where we could plug these lights in and use them. Uh, so uh, infrastructure is, is an important thing. Uh, do you have electrical plugs where you need them? Do you have enough breakers where you need them? Is your internet run where it needs to be? Do you have your Wi-Fi locations where they need them? I mean, all of those kind of things. The infrastructure, if you, as he said, if you need two wires, run four. I mean, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, you, can, you can lay down some infrastructure even for future uh, possibilities. Uh, we just, as part of our whole transition that we're doing, we just put in a new system in our fellowship hall. It's, it's a, it's really more than a fellowship hall. It's, it's a, like a worship center, but it's, uh, it's got a U-shaped balcony in it, and we use it for a lot of different things. But it's, it'll seat about 500 total when we get everybody crammed in there. Um, and so we put a new system in. Um, we just installed a, a Bose sound system and uh, put some new lighting, intelligent lighting in there for our, our bandlet service to be able to do the things it needs to do in there. But in our installation, we came in and one day we'd come in and the, the stage boxes down on the stage would be on. The next day we'd come in and they would be off. But did you turn them? I didn't turn, did you turn them no. We had a sequencer that was supposed to turn everything on and off. The next day we'd come in and they'd be on again. And we couldn't figure out what was going on. We had two uh, circuits, one on either side of the stage, that were run. And they were already there. And so what we did is we just came off of those two 
added more plug, wall plugs, okay, and thought everything was fine. Well, they would be on and they would be off. So we brought the electricians out there to start tracing stuff down. Well, as it turned out, when they built this building uh, in 92, the circuit on this side that, that goes down to the main stage, they tied in to the circuit that runs the timer for the stained glass window on the outside of the front of the building. So that timer was kicking in and kicking off on that electrical, and our stage boxes would come in. Sometimes they'd be on, and sometimes they wouldn't. And the timer was not even accurate. It was uh, off its timing. So infrastructure is very important, and you need to have that checked out because you never know what you may find uh, when you try to do something like that. Uh, and usually infrastructure is a cost that people forget about. Uh, and, and infrastructure can run up costs pretty quickly. Uh, you have an electrician come in and run some conduit and add some circuit breakers, you've, you know, you've got some cost. Uh, we did that with the room that I just showed you. We basically had all of our electricity coming down one side because all of our racks were on one side. Well, we had to take all of those off and move those basically over the other side. And just, they didn't add any circuits, they, didn't, they just took the wiring and dropped it in a different place. And it was like three or four thousand dollars to do that. So uh, infrastructure is, is something you really need to check on. Also, sometimes infrastructure is where you can save a little money. Uh, when we did this project, I told the company that helped us. I said, "We, I will have volunteers. We will provide. We will do all of the cable running that needs to be done. If there's a Cat Five line that needs to be run somewhere, we'll do it. If there's camera cables that need to be run, we'll do it. And I had guys come because they could do that." And it saved us probably $2,000, $2,500 just having our people come and string those cables through the walls because engineers that come install, they don't like doing that. So uh, that was, now we didn't do the electrical. We did make sure that I wasn't gonna mess with that. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, come on, next thing. Spend time with more than one company, okay? Uh, if you're buying, New microphones. I mean, don't ever just, unless you have somebody that you really know and trust and can do that. But if you're doing a major project, like if you're changing out to an HD situation or you're doing new projectors or you're, you know, those kind of things, have conversations with more than one company. And I don't mean just call them up and say, what's your bid? I mean, have conversations with them. Sit down with them and talk through what it is you want to do. Uh, first of all, it's a learning process. Because these guys will have different ideas, and you may learn something that you need to do. Uh, when we began this process, I didn't think there was any way that we could afford to have a raw switcher. Uh, I just they use them here at McLean Stadium uh, and and the Ferrell Center and the places around here. And I thought, hey, just, I, we're not going to be able to afford that. We're going to have to find something cheaper. Well, one of the companies I sat down with, they brought in the Ross area sales rep and we sat down and talked and this is what I need and this is what I need and, and he was able to put something together in a price range that I just I didn't believe that we would be able to do so that's why we have a raw switcher um, so you never know so I sit down and have conversations with these guys uh, don't necessarily say okay this is the equipment that I'm going to need and this is what I want you to bid on say okay here's what we want to accomplish what would be your plan for doing that Give them that opportunity. Now, what you don't want to do is take that and then go to everybody else and say, okay, what are you going to give me a bid on this? Okay, You need to do the same with everybody so that that person's not spending their time and effort so that you can give the bid to somebody else. Um, but you do need to sit down and talk. Uh, we had about four companies that I worked with. Uh, to pull, we finally narrowed it down to the one that we wanted to deal with. Um, and there was one company that... Uh, I mean, I knew the guy, so it helped a little bit, but there was one company that said, uh, you know, uh, he came and sat down and we talked for a few minutes. He said, I'll be happy to help you with anything and the ideas you have. He says, we're just, at this point in time, we're so busy, we couldn't take the bid if we wanted to. So, but I'll be happy to help you and talk, and, and I did. I called him a couple of times and about things, what if we did it this way, you know? Um, especially the, the engineers and the guys that do a lot of the install and stuff, they, they love talking that kind of thing. So, uh, Find more than one company. And actually, the company that we got was not local. It was out of Dallas. Um, I talked to a couple of local companies, but 
we wound up getting a company out of Dallas. Uh, just because, uh, well, they were the best in a lot of areas. But anyway, don't try to implement this on your own. Uh, even if it's something as simple as installing a, a new audio board, and I say that's simple, that may not be simple for some people, uh, nowadays with digital boards, um, don't try to do this on your own. Uh, first of all, the people that do the installs and do this kind of thing, they have ways, they've done it before. The, the guy that came and the engineer that helped us install, uh, he did that during the week, but on the weekends he was an engineer for Major League Baseball. So he would go and work the trucks at, at Major League Baseball. So this guy knew what he was talking about. And he would come in and I would say, okay, how we, since, especially since we were dealing with broadcast, a lot of broadcasts we were doing, how do we need to do this? And he would say, well, this is the way we do this, and this is the way we do this, and you'll need this router and you'll need to do that. And then once, once we got the equipment installed, he was going, I bet you didn't know this would do this, or this might do this and it was really nice to help with us. Um, we, uh, we changed, before we had been sending a microwave signal to the station, but now we're actually streaming our HD signal to the station. Uh, we're using what the, the company's called Teradec, they have these little streamers called cubes, and uh, an encoder and a decoder. Well, Mark, uh, the engineer, he knew enough about all of this because he, had wor he works with it, all the time to know all the settings, to go in and know what to play with and how to get to maximize the bandwidth and, and all of those kind of things, which I probably could have figured out, but it would have taken me weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to do that. And so uh, don't try to do this on your own. Plus, usually most of these places, if, especially if you set them up, dude, they'll do a training. They get the audio board set up, you bring in all your guys, they'll sit down with you session and say, okay, let's work through what it is you need to do. And they'll train uh, so that, that will help you immensely uh, because they use these boards and they mess with these boards and they install these boards or whatever it might be, whether it's a projector or whatever. So don't try to implement this on your own. Uh, communicate with your volunteers before the installation, okay? Uh, almost every volunteer I have that works on our crew, at some point before we did this, I sat down with them and I said, here's what we're looking to do. I know you run a camera every week. We're not going to be doing remote cameras anymore. We're going to be putting you, standing you up behind a camera and showing you how to do that. Um, and we want you to feel comfortable with that uh, because uh, we know it's a change for you. Uh, graphics person, we're having a new computer. We're going to be doing some graphics a little differently than we did before. So we just want you to know that. What happens with that is they get a buy-in. They know what's happening. Somebody comes to them and says, hey, what's that? Oh, yeah, man, it's going to be great. You know? The second thing is, they may have an idea about their area that you need to hear. Well, you know, one of the things that came out of that, I had two or three, I had two or three volunteers that, that great sit there with a joystick and run a remote camera, but that's because they can sit down. They, for whatever reason, they have a hard time standing for a solid hour. So, literally, our third camera that we set up in the balcony is designed so you can sit and run it right at the edge of the balcony. So I've got a place for any of my camera people that want to, still want to run a camera and be a part of this, they can do that, even though they can't stand. Um, that's just a, one example. But they, they, can, they can tell you, you know, I, that, that makes things real difficult and, and hard to do if you do it that way. Okay, well, let me think. Let me, let's go back to the drawing board and see what we can work out. But they felt comfortable about what we were doing because I sat down with each of them and talked through that. Uh, they may not always like it, you know, you have to be gentle with them sometimes uh, and say, well, this is what we're going to do, you know, because this is what we need to do that's best for the church. But uh, anyway, communicate with your volunteers. Uh, break it into stages if possible. Now, we were in a situation where um, the HD part had to happen quick because it had to all be up and running. But uh, the component, there's a couple of components that we're working with that we are now implementing uh, just this next month. One is live streaming. I, we now have the capability of doing that that we did before, but I didn't want to jump in with that and all the other that we were doing. The other thing is we're going to an all at 11. All our services are going to be 11 o'clock. We have three different venues all at 11. So we're going to be doing uh, projecting sermons 
And so that technology I'm working on now, we're actually going to be doing recording and playback. Slip, they call it time slip, is what they call it, uh, down to our fellowship hall. But I didn't want to do that on the same Sunday I was trying to do, you know, okay, is all this HD equipment going to work the first Sunday? So break it into, into segments so that, number one, your volunteers don't get overwhelmed, and number two, you can kind of make sure things work and run properly. It took us about three or four Sundays to get our streaming to the station right. Uh, we played with the bandwidth and, and the cache sizes and files and all that, and to get, you know, to get it exactly where we needed it to be. So we didn't want to be doing a lot of other things uh, on top of that. Uh, so break it into stages if possible. And then never doubt God's plan, okay? I'm, I'm making an automatic assumption on this that whatever changes you make, you bathe in prayer. You prayed about it, and you know that this is the best thing for what you need to do. Uh, but never doubt God's plan. Uh, and and this, is the, this is the proof for it. Uh, last year, our pastor came to me and he said, how much do you think it would cost get us this HD. And so I, I have some numbers in it. Uh, probably being a little lack of faith. And so I said, well, I think we can do it for 200000 um, I should have asked for about 300000 but I said $200,000. Um, and he says, okay. So we started working from that basis. And uh, in February, we set up a plan. We were going to do a campaign, uh, put the word out to the church. Um, you know, here's what we need. The church knew we needed to make this upgrade. It was something we'd been building on, so it's just a matter of saying, okay, give, and we're going to make a special offering, and we're going to put this together. Two Sundays into our announcements, a person walked up with a $200,000 check and said, here, we want you to do this. Uh, man, it still it chills up my spine when I think about it. Uh, I'll be a little faith. But never doubt God's plan. If you, if you know that this is the direction it needs to go, you've prayed about it, you've done your homework, you, people know how much it's going to cost um, and exactly what all this is going to do, and you lay it out there, God will provide. He will. Um, now, he may not always have one person walk up and hand you a check, and he may have you alter things a little bit as you go along your process. I'm not saying that always happens. But... Um, it's amazing to watch. Uh, it just it changed the whole uh, faith attitude, not only of our staff, we were blown away by it, but my volunteers, all of that, uh, just to be able to say, guys, we're done. We didn't have to continue the campaign. We really didn't even get into the campaign, seriously. Uh, we said, okay, we got our 200000 Now, I wish what they had said is, okay, we've got 200000 let's keep going and see how much we can get, but they didn't want to do that. They, you know, you said 200000 so you're going to do it for 200000 um, But anyway, it, God does some incredible things uh, through the whole process. Um, where's my news? Come on, there we go. First of all, any questions about installation, doing, making changes, things like that? Um, Media, how, what? how do you deal with uh, uh, new, new uh, equipment and the decoration and the architecture of the church? <laughs> yes, um, that's a that's a touchy thing. <laughs> um, and in, I'll give you a couple examples. Number one, in '98, when we did the renovation at our church, we went to we had speakers that were up in our proscenium, uh, and in the ceiling, it was really a elaborate setup. We had horns that were one place and separate subs that were for night, and that was done in 78, so for that, that was pretty awesome. But we were going to a center cluster, okay, uh, right over the pulpit area. That, that was what we had said, that was the newer technology at that time, so we decided that's where we were going. Uh, and I bet you I spent probably two months with the committee that was working as the, the trying to convince them that white speakers hanging on a white ceiling, five speakers up here, were not going to be a problem. I mean, we had one time where they developed, they wanted a curtain that was going to go around them that would kind of, you know, <laughs> and we worked and worked and worked on that, and, and finally, I got them to just trust me on this, okay? Just trust me. 
Well, you know, there were some people that were in our church almost three months when, oh, there's speakers up there, you know? Um, they didn't really, and it was never another, another issue. When we did this recent one in the Fellowship Hall, um, we, uh, we were getting a Bose system, and Bose designed it, and the, guy, the guys that were doing the project, the company that we hired, we, it had been made known to them that we were going to really have this place rock and roll, okay? So they designed, Bose designed these arrays, and they brought them in and they hung them. And now our ceilings are 20 feet tall, okay? These things were, yeah, they were about four feet wide. There were four speaker cabinets on each one. They hung, because of the way they had to structure them, they hung almost two feet before the, the truss started, okay, down from the ceiling. They were almost eight feet tall, the arrays were, okay? So you've got two feet, eight feet, that's 10 feet. It's a 20-foot ceiling, okay? <laughs> These things were, like, right here. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, there was a whole big story behind how that happened. But our pastor walked in and he goes, no, let me back up. Our youth man walked in, and our college minister walked in, and they go, oh, this is awesome. This is great. <laughs> our pastor walked in, and he's not any older than them. He's only 30 three years, 34 years old. He said, I don't think that's going to fly. <laughs> you know, we use this room for a lot of different things and it's just, it's not. So we went back and we had them reconfigure and everything and, and we wound up with actually using two cabinets on either side and they're much higher up. They're still black. We didn't feel like we could afford, uh, my choice would have been to have them painted the color of the ceiling, but which you can do, it costs a little more. But uh, what we think we're okay with that. It, it's one of those things, form and function kind of questions. Um, if there's anything you can do to help show people in examples, okay, this is what. The other thing is if, if there's a way to get them to see the benefits of what you're trying to do. In other words, if we have to hang an array next to the, uh, oh, uh, when we put our screens in our sanctuary, we had to take down two of the chandeliers. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That was, that was, we have eight chandeliers hanging in that room. It's a very Georgian style sanctuary. Uh, and that, yeah, that, but it's kind of one of those things where the people made their little fuss and then once they started seeing the benefits and the positives from having the screens and what we did, everybody was fine. You know, uh, you try to do as much as you can. You work real hard with, with form. You make it blend in as much as you can, even if you need to spend a little bit more money to make that work. Uh, because that's a good thing. That's not, it's not like the, the form gets in your way. That's a good thing. If you can have a room that, that looks the way it's supposed to and not have things that seem out of place, then that's good. Um, but you, it, it may cost you a little bit more money uh, you just have to love on those people and build their trust and let them know that when you make this change, it's going to be okay. Um, so there's no real easy answer on that other than don't, don't forget the form part of it. Don't just say, well, I mean, this is what we got to do, so this is what we got to do. Um, I, I had this discussion with our, when we went back to the man cameras. We were putting man cameras down in places where people behind them might have our, you know, they would be blocked. And I, we, we went back and forth and back and forth on that, and we made some compromises. One of my cameras is, the center camera is as close as we, it's right up under our balcony edge, and there's, so there's some people behind, they're gonna be blocked. Uh, the camera that I wanted on the side, I wanted closer down to the sanctuary, to the pulpit uh, platform area, and we were gonna cut some pews and make it work there, and. So no, it's just going to block too many people. So we backed it up, and, and we're just dealing with it with a different lens and that kind of thing. So, uh, again, talking through those can help sometimes. Uh, people don't like change, uh, and, and there are people that believe there's something sacred about the way a room looks. 
not entirely untrue. So let's respect to some degree their desire. That most of them are coming from a heart that wants to respect and, and honor God's house. And so if we keep that in, in our minds, that's what, they're, that's what they're trying to do, that's their goal, uh, then we can work with them and try to work through and, and find some, some compromises and some way to work. That would be my best advice to you. Doesn't always work. Sometimes you just have people that get hacked off at you. But uh, anyway, any other questions? Um, media is a ministry, okay? Um, it, maybe at one time, uh, sound guys and lighting guys and things like that were just tech guys that came in and did something or whatever. Media is a ministry. It is a way that we, as people who are interested in that and feel called to that and want to do that, um, can serve and can use what we know and what we have to put out the message of Christ and to help a church to worship, to help a church to uh, be educated in, in, in God's Word, do all of those things, whether it's an, an AV cart in a room or a, a, a flat screen at an entr door entrance that has announcements on it or an audio board or whatever it might be. Um, it is a ministry. First and foremost is a ministry of communicating the gospel. Okay, so every time you do something, how is this helping me to communicate the gospel? It goes back to our mission, our church mission. How has it helped me to do this? And secondly, how does it help the rest of the ministries of my church? I always see myself as a support for the youth ministry, for the children's ministry, for the international ministry. How can I help them use the technology that we have today to, to accomplish what they want to do? That may be in different levels. Uh, for I also do uh, technology in our church, uh, all the website and networking and computers and all that. Well, one of the things that we do is provide a small uh, computer lab for our international ministry because they have classes to help internationals work on computers and do with their English as a second language and citizenship classes and all that kind of thing. So that's my way of supporting them to help them to do that. Um, you know, obviously youth ministry is kind of an obvious thing. There's, they use lots of videos and lots of music and lots of all that kind of stuff. Uh, college the same way. Um, children's ministry, one of my supports is we have set up an automated check-in system um, where we have you know, they come in and they punch the computer and it prints out a label for their kid and, and all of that. Well, that's my way of supporting the children, helping them accomplish their mission so they can spend their time doing other things. So if you can, if you yourself can get this way and then help people understand, media is a ministry unto itself. It is a way of, of ministering to people um, the gospel of Christ. Um, there are churches now with online uh campuses is what they call them. You, maybe your church does it, I don't know. But they stream their services, and we're trying to get to that point, where they're streaming their services several times a week, and they're inviting people to be involved, and they have chat room volunteers available if somebody wants to chat while that service is going on. Uh, we have other people in our area that, uh, that follow us online if you want to connect with them, and yada yada. And it's really a, a second campus, uh, is what it is. And so this the idea of, men, of media being a way to actually minister to people more than just being a way to have sound in the sanctuary or words on the screen or things like that. If you can go, we have a verse that we use uh, that has sort of been my motto on this. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. You see the words I bolded. We proclaim what we have seen, what we have heard. We write. These are all forms of communication. Um, they are saying that what we've seen with our eyes, we, we want to proclaim that to you. We want to tell that to you. We want you to see and to hear and to be able to proclaim. That's the next step then. Um, you know, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So media is, 
important from that standpoint. It is a ministry that we do. And I, something that I didn't pick up on immediately, but I picked up on a little later. It says we write this to make our joy complete. I never quite heard it that way. You know, I always thought, well, okay, we're, we're telling them what they've seen, what we've heard, to, so that their joy will be. No, we're doing this for our joy to be complete. I've got people in my church that are part of my media ministry that just, they just love what they do because they're helping other people to be able to worship. Uh, and being able to take those, whether they're talents or gifts or desires, they may not have the talents and gifts, but they have the desire, um, to do that makes their joy complete. And so then the media becomes a ministry not to other people, but to the people who are literally helping you every Sunday. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure as part of your technology area, you kind of begin to catch a little glimpse or maybe re-catch a glimpse of how this can be not just a technology thing to do, but a ministry thing to do. Questions? I think our time, ooh, we're actually a couple minutes past our time. So. All right, thanks guys, I appreciate it.